Henry Clay Wallace versus the Abomination. Let's get straight into that. He rode quietly through the cold Oklahoma forest. A fit of frost was in the air. His rifle was draped over his saddle in front of him. The man was uneasy. He had left his home range with two other men to hunt, and they knew they were large herds of deer north of the Red River, in Indian territory. He reined his big Appaloosa up. Before him lay a large, well-beaten game trail. Tree branches stretched over the trail from both sides, giving the trail an appearance of a tunnel. Wallace reached over and stroked the big horse's neck. The horse didn't like this, and neither did Henry Clay. Sitting there, he was sure he heard movement moving stealthily towards him, coming from the tunnel. Reins in hand, he backed the big horse back. The horse had no intention of standing in front of that haunted entrance. If something or someone was moving towards them, he wanted to be ready. Now Ray Tyler had shot and killed a nice big mule deer. He spent most of the morning dressing it out, watching for black bears, wolves and cougars. Now he had all the meat and their hide loaded. But he felt watched. Had it been any of the native peoples, well, they would have made themselves known and probably would have offered help for part of the meat. But he saw nor heard anyone. Neil Wilson sat in camp tending a fire and looking after all their gear. He heard the one rifle shot, but I heard no more. He fed the fire and stayed close. A year had passed since his belief system had been shattered on sacred baby mountain. In the following year, he'd worked hard, saving his money. He owed Ollie Scott a visit in Colorado, but didn't want to make the trip empty-handed. His plan was to buy a couple ahead of cattle on his way west and have enough ready money to become partners if Ollie wanted him. And he rolled a cigarette. He was becoming uneasy now. Twice, as he circled the camp, he thought he heard grunting sounds. And when he stopped walking, the grunting stopped. When he began again, so would the grunting. He heard the sound of hooves coming towards the camp and saw Ray Tyler leading a pack of horse with a deer hide, antlers, and what he assumed was venison. Seen anything, Hank? Asked Ray. Eh, nothing since you both rolled out this morning. I see you got a good one. Tyler grinned. Yeah, one shot. We'll eat good tonight. Help me start on load and we'll get cooking some steaks and frying some spots. Oh, sounds good to me. Think we'll have a heavy frost tonight. Yeah, that old cabin's still in decent shape. Yeah, better now. Tied a rope from the front just inside to the back wall to hitch the horses to. Cold night coming. So will predators looking for a meal. Tyler looked over the outside of the building. I just wish you had a roof, but beggars can't be choosers. And plus, we can build a fire inside. Floor's dirt. Build a fire pit. Brought in the dry firewood. We're ready to get a good night's sleep. In the distance, they heard three rapid shots. Well, that's something ain't good, Neil. Hank don't miss a deer with one shot, much less have to shoot it three times. Well, let's get my horse and this pack horse inside. You start a fire and I'll watch for Hank. Henry Clay rose slightly in the saddle. He sighted down the barrel of the rifle. The Appaloosa was nervous and wanted to run, to flee, but it had confidence in its rider. The wolf broke out of the tunnel, leaping and snarling, and Henry Clay eased his breath out and squeezed the trigger. The huge wolf went down. It snapped at where the bullet had hit him, and Wallace fired his second round. The wolf was still, but Wallace heard another sound coming out from the tunnel of limbs and fired a third time. Whatever had intended to come out paused. Horse, I'm done for the day. Let's get out of here. And Wallace forked another piece of steak, added more fried potatoes, and refilled his coffee mug. But he was tired. He and his horse and pack animal had returned to find their campsite had four wolves and two well-armed men watching for him. He climbed off his horse and handed the reins and sat down by the fire, still burning outdoors. That old building have a good door? Yeah, why? Uh, safety. I killed a hell of a big wolf back there. A uh, wolf or coyote? Wolf free. Damn biggest one I ever seen. Took two shots to put his nose in the dirt. Ah, uh, yeah, Ray. It was a wolf. Uh, what was the third shot for? Insurance? Uh, you might say that. Something else was out there. Moving slowly, but even after the wolf was down, I kept hearing it coming. And so I fired a warning shot. Uh, it seemed to work, but me and the horses were ready to get back to camp. Now Wilson stood up and walked over to the front door and closed it. He lay a wooden bar across. 
and turning, they saw Tyler and Wallace looking at him. And he shrugged. A cold night. And the three men slept near the fire. Any casual observer would have observed three men sleeping peacefully. What they wouldn't have seen was that each man slept with a Colt 45 peacemaker in their hand, and that all three were light sleepers. Henry Clay Wallace slept facing the front door. Neil Wilson appeared to be sleeping and facing the animals. Ray Tyler lay on his back, turning his head ever so often, watching the top of the walls. The cold wind rattled the old building, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Deep into the night there was a scream. All three men rolled out of the bedrolls. Wilson built a fire up a bit, grabbed his rifle, and moved near the horses who were beginning to act skittish. Neil spoke severely to each one, stroking their necks and telling them that they'd be all right. Tyler covered the only window in the house which was beside the front door, and Wallace had opened the door a bit here. The screams, the shrieking continued throughout the night. At times they sounded as if they were coming from just beyond the tree line, and at other times it sounded as if whatever was shrieking was circling the old, ruined cabin. And the horses were uneasy, but Neil was doing what he could to calm them. He spoke severely and rubbed their necks. Ray moved from window to the fire, where he'd add fuel to the fire, or fill the coffee pot with more water. True, the coffee was weakened, but it was hot and drinkable. Now Ray filled three cups and took one to Neil. He thanked him, and another cup he took to Henry Clay, who stood against the inside of the door, searching the tree line. Here you go, Hank. I had to be weak, but it's hot. Ah, uh, thanks, Ray. I ain't seen anything? Wallace gestured with his head towards a stretch of forest approximately 60 yards away from the campsite. I saw the antlers of a really huge deer moving back into the trees, and then it was gone. Well, come to think about it, that thing making all that racket, it could have been a deer. Kind of sounded like one. And Wallace continued to watch. The shrieking and grunts continued throughout the night, and as morning began to break, Everything went silent. Ah, well, similar. Sure wasn't an elk bugling or snorting last night. Nope. He stretched and took up his rifle. And Tyler looked up with a questioning look on his face. Had a heavy frost last night. Think I'll have a look around. Might see some tracks left in the frost. Figure out what might have been singing to us last night. Well, whoever was singing to us last night and early this morning... Neil said sarcastically, Sure as hell, can't carry a tune. It sings way off key. And Wallace and Tyler looked over to Neil, who was busy cooking some bacon and biscuits. I'll be back in ten or less, boys. Now, Neil, he laughed. Don't go and eat all that bacon. Henry Clay was much more at home on a horse than on foot, yet he moved easily across the opening. He had one point. He was headed towards points where he thought he'd observe the huge deer moving deeper into the shadows. And as he neared the edge of the clearing, he caught the smell of rotten or decomposing meat. He pulled his neckerchief up over his nose and began surveying the ground. And he was about ready to give up when he saw the enormous hoof prints of what appeared to be from a deer. He knelt and studied it even more. He tilted his hat back and rubbed his chin. The tracks were bipedal. Whatever species of deer this was appeared to walk on its hind legs. And the three men ate in silence, each with their own thoughts. Neil wiped his hands off on a rag and asked, What kind of deer walks on its hind legs and sounds like the devil himself screaming? Yeah, none I've heard, my friend, replied Tyler. Say, this might be one of those beast men you guys fought last winter, up in the yard buckles. No, Wallace said. These were hooves. The Hatakofi, as we were told they were called, or their feet looked a lot like ours, only larger. Out west in Arizona or New Mexico, the Indians have witches they call skinwalkers, who can become masters, said Tyler. Maybe one of them found their way into these mountains and we mistakenly entered their perceived territory. It's a thought. Wallace finished his biscuits and bacon, and he sipped on his coffee. That's something to think about. I'm tired. We can either not hunt this morning or get some rest. Or we can cut some saplings and make this place a bit better. More secure. And hunt tomorrow. And Neil stood up, checked his handgun, and picked up the axe. Ah, well, let's get busy.
they spend the next several hours cutting saplings down and putting several of them on top of the old cabin. Firewood was gathered, and the only window in the cabin was covered halfway with wood and a piece of an old burlap sack. If the creature returned on this night, it would be met with gunfire. Late in the afternoon, as they lounged by the fire, they heard the sounds of an old man admonishing someone to hurry. They listened as he was telling whoever he was talking to that he knew of an abandoned cabin. It had a decent door and four walls, and they'd be safe there. Wallace stepped to the door and greeted the old man and a youngster who couldn't have been any older than twelve or thirteen. The old man was startled and started to raise his rifle. And Wallace held the palms of his hands up to show he meant no harm. Ah, easy, old-timer. We're friendly. Just here to do some hunting. Is this your cabin? No, I just knew it was here. Me and my grandson here. This is Kevin. We hope to hold up here tonight for sure. Well, you still can. Come in. Neil was brought in venison steak and we got some potatoes, bacon and the coals. Coffee. Well, and plenty of firewood. Well, the old man looked around. Well, he was looking. Finally, he accepted the invitation and rushed the boy inside the cabin. And he noticed the partial roof. Y'all did that? Yes, sir. You covered the window? Uh-huh. You men well armed? You may need to be. Uh, we are. What are you running from, old man? A devil. Well, we heard it the night before last. Sounded like a woman screaming bloody murder. Then it started making sounds like a deer in a rut. Next morning, our pack horses were dead. No wounds, but it looked like something had sucked all the soft organs out. and just left the outside of the body intact. So, you headed here? I gotta take care of my grandson. You understand. Well, I understand, but whatever was after you and the boy a couple of nights ago, I was here last night. Did you? Did you get a look at it? No. I did see his tracks this morning. Strange. Really large hooves. Ah. The old man sighed and took his pipe out, filled it, and asked for more coffee. Right, this afternoon, you, you told me your name was Wallace. Any relation to Henry Clay Wallace, the gunfighter? I am Henry Clay Wallace. Is it true you fought the attack I fear last year in these parts? In the arm buckles. Neil there was with me. Why? What's this got to do with those creatures? I just wanted to find out if you still got an open mind and enough sand to deal with this. Well, if you know something, old man, you need to tell Hank, Neil, and me, said Ray Tyler. I know what it might be. But I'm reluctant to talk about it in front of the boy. When he goes to sleep, we'll talk more. Wallace checked the door's bar and eased down next to the fire. It burned no lamp this night. The wind howled like lost souls. Neil wrapped a blanket around himself and listened. There were dark, heavy clouds overhead. The makeshift roof covered most of the room. Once in a while, a coyote voiced his loneliness. Wallace rubbed his eyes. He was tired, weary, and curious. He knew he needed sleep, but he wanted more answers. You said your name was Samuels? Right, Frank Samuels, from Alabama. Ah, I used to know a family in Clay County, Missouri. Name Samuels. No relation, I suppose. Jesse and Frank are first cousins, Mr. Wallace. Tyler took a sip of coffee and looked thoughtfully at the old man. Jesse and Frank? You talking about the Janes brothers? Uh, yes, but we don't want no trouble. Uh, you won't have no trouble from us, Wallace replied. We're just here to hunt deer and maybe a buffalo. We'll be fine one. Uh, were you supposed to meet up with them up here somewhere? No, nope. we just wanted a fresh start. Kevin's parents died in a fire. I'm his grandfather, but I thought a boy needed a new beginning. A, f- a fresh start. I brought him up here to hunt and trap. And in that thing, I came along. Grandpa, the boy said sleepily. Grandpa, is it all right if I go to sleep now? Sure, son. You get some sleep. I'm going to spell Mr. Wallace. He looks beat. (laughs) I am, Ray. You give Mr. Samuels a hand. Wake me and Neil in three hours and we'll take over. Right. What if that thing comes back squalling and shrieking again? Want me to try and kill it? (laughs) Just wake us up. Let the boy sleep. In just a few minutes, Wallace was asleep. Wallace was awakened by Ray Tyler, 
Neil was already making some fresh coffee. The fire felt good. It was extremely cold. Sam was better down next to the boy, but he was awake. Anything, Ray? Not a blessed sound. Not even an owl hooting. Only wind blowing hard through the trees. It must be what? Close to one o'clock? Closer to two. Well, it's lining back to the north. Mr. Samuel said if it holds off until at the daybreak, well, we could put some more saplings up and stretch some canvas and we'll stay a little warmer and drier. It sounds like a plan. Neil, pour me a cup. You better get some sleep, Ray. He glanced over towards Samuels. Yeah, you too, Frank. A lot to do early. And the night was bitterly cold and the creature was starving. It had fed off the wolf Wallace had killed this morning, but it still craved sustenance. It knew where living creatures were. They were inside the old log building. It knew they had been joined by an old man and a child. It could wait. It could feed almost any time it wished, but it must make the food last a while. Then it found the small village west of where he knew the men were held up in. The village consisted of only two teepees. It entered the village. The village dogs tucked their tails and fled. So the creature simply entered the teepees and slaughtered those sleeping inside. The creature travelled alone. Only during the mating season did it seek one of its kind. And then afterwards, they parted company and went their separate ways. This year, the creature had travelled too far south of its normal stomping grounds. But the food well, was plentiful. The game it found seemed shocked when it appeared. It revelled in the sheer terror it produced when it stepped into the light of a campfire. And it reveled in the sheer terror it produced when it stepped into the light of a campfire. And the morning sun was rising and would soon rise over the mountains, rising higher and higher. It was time now to retreat into the dark recesses of a cave it had found and made its home. Soon the snows would come to these mountains, snow and ice, but it always made its presence known when the cold blew in out of the north country. And tonight, come moonlight, Come dark clouds, it will require food. It remembered where the food was close by. The men had rested last night, and they would rest again today. But the night, I was his. Henry Clay shot and killed a nice eight point early that afternoon. He was nowhere near the spooky tunnel like area where he killed the wolf, and he was filled dressing a deer when he heard the ponies coming towards him. The Indians. He continued to dress the deer and kept his eyes on the riders. He didn't anticipate trouble, but with some men, well, he never knew. There were four in a party. Each carried a sharp's fifty cow. The man in the lead reined his pony up and looked the deer over. Halito, brothers. You speak our language, Henry Clay Wallace? No, only a greeting. How do you know who I am? We know many things. Nice deer. Yes, are you hunting? In a way, we seek a creature who kills for pleasure, takes the soft internal organs and leaves no marks. Well, our camp is a few miles north of here. The skies are darkening with the approach of a storm, or icy weather. Would you and your friends care to shadow with us? We have nothing to offer. Well, you have those shops. One old man in the camp has one. They and your friends may come in handy. And the Choctaw brave looked down at Wallace. You've seen it? I saw something, but I found tracks like deer's only much larger. And this creature, it walks on two legs. And the Choctaw Braves began to talk back and forth. They understood English, and they knew Wallace was no great speaker of their language. The man Wallace had been speaking to said something, and they all dismounted and began helping her skin and dress the deer. Occasionally, one would look towards the sky, say something, and they would work faster. And soon, they were finished, and Wallace's pack animal was loaded. And they followed him back to camp. Ray Tyler spoke over his shoulder to no one in particular. Better add some more beans and spots tonight, Neil. Hanks bring a guess. The addition of the Choctaw Braves and their big sharps fifties made the filling inside the four walls much better. And there was some small talk, but mostly they talked softly. A couple of the Braves dozed, wrapped themselves in blankets and buffalo robes. Neil had rolled up his blankets near the fire pulled the brim of his hat over his eyes and listened to the wind. Frank Samuels filled and lit his pipe, but his grandson slept quietly. Frank, do you know what this thing is? Well, it's killing folks, trying to draw us out. Had the head of a deer, huge antlers, moves on hind legs. It's tall, 
maybe seven or eight feet. It leaves hoof prints that look like a giant deer. I don't know what the name is that they put on it. If it is what I think it is, well, it's way out of its regular stomping grounds. Well, I'd like to know, and so would the rest of us. The old man took a deep draw on his pipe. Lightning flashed across the sky, and there was a roar unlike anything one could imagine, and every man was on his feet. The boy struggled out from under his covers and looked at his grandfather. Frank. Uh, up north, near the Canadian border, they call these things Wendigo. Oh, they're man-eaters. It's supposed to be supernatural. Ray spit tobacco juice on the cold dirt floor. Ah, supernatural, my ass. If they kill to eat, they're not some kind of haint. The leader of the Choctaw Braves, a man called Dogkiller, nodded in agreement. I agree. If he needs food, but his flesh and blood he can be killed. Hanks, Neil asked, you see anything? I watched the edge of the wood line near that huge elm tree. Next flash of light, there! The creature stood just to the left of the huge elm. Oh, it was horrible. While Wallace had estimated to stand seven to eight feet tall, it was plain to see it was well over ten foot tall. Long, sparsely covered arms hung down towards what had to be knees. The thing's hands were as large as metal plates they had eaten off of, with long fingers and it enclosed that looked like long, hunted knives. It was a light grey colour. Its head was that of a large deer, the difference being it possessed a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth. Adorning the top of this creature's head was a large set of very large and sharp antlers. Kill it, Hank, came the voice of Neil Wilson. Kill it or it's going to kill some of us. Without hesitation, Wallace stepped quickly out of the doorway, lifted his rifle and fired. One shot and he knew it hit the creature. It rotated and bit at its right shoulder. Wallace fired a second round and heard his bullet slam into the midsection of the creature. It only angered it more. Frank Samuel shouldered Wallace aside and fired the sharps as the Wendigo began an awkward advance towards the cabin. The fifty caliber slammed into the creature and forced it backwards a step or two. And its screams, Tyler said later, sounded like a banshee, all liquored up. Yet surprisingly, it continued to advance. The Choctaw all fired their sharps fifties, and they too forced the creature back. Neil and Ray poured lead into the creature with the Winchesters, and nothing was stopping the creature. The lightning flashed again, and thunder rolled across the mountain. Nothing had appeared would stop this, this creature from frozen hell. Rifles were reloaded, more shots were fired, and eventually the creature was forced back to the tree line, where it disappeared into the primal forest. All the men were sat silent. Nothing in their backgrounds had prepared them for what just happened. Hank, will you fire those beast men? And Dog Killer interjected. Attack, Offy. Yeah, what he said. Did it take this much or more to kill them? And Wallace was quiet, and he shook his head. No. You got any idea how we killed this abomination? Well, Ray, we heard it. It's got to be losing blood. I think it'll go wherever it's done is and try to recover. Well, give us a chance to get out alive. Uh, you, Neil, y'all pack up and head south in the morning. Take Frank and Kevin with you. I'll stay and help Dark Killer and his braves track this thing down and finish it off. I'm not going. A quiet voice replied. And neither is my gramps. We're going to stay here and help kill that monster. No, nah, I'm not leaving either, Hank. Nor I suspect will Ray. And Neil's right. I ain't leaving anyone behind. And Samuel spoke up. Oh, you boys ride for the brand. I like that. I'm proud to ride the river with y'all. You got any ideas, Wallace? That's simple. We track it to its lair. We light torches, go inside, find it, and pour more lead into it. And then we burn the damn thing. What if there's another one? And we kill it too. Well, there was plenty of blood on the ground and on the back of the trees. The thing's tracks led them for a few miles into an area with large rocky outcroppings. And Kevin found a track leading into a cave. This had to be the creature's lair. Now the hunters made torches, doused them in coal oil and lit them. Neil lit an oil burning lantern and they entered the cave. The stench was near overpowering, and Wallace led the way. Approximately fifty yards in, they rounded a bend and saw the creature on its knees taking a ragged breath of air. It turned to face the men, but was unable to rise to its feet 
and attack. Wallace motioned Dog Killer to join him, and the Choctaw had no need for explanation. Wallace said everyone should plug their ears. The single shot from the sharps entered the base of the creature's head, and it uttered a final shriek and collapsed. Kevin, give me your lantern, said Wallace. He stepped up to the still body and poured the oil all over it, and took a torch and ignited it. Flames shot up, and the smell of burning flesh oh, it was horrible. Samuels led his grandson out, and Dogkiller's braves brought more wood in to finish the cremating of the body. Wallace walked out to take a breath of cold, fresh air. The legend of Henry Clay Wallace reads like an adventure. Gone fighting cattleman, hunter, and monster killer. As some say he had nothing to do with the destruction of a Wendigo. Others say he was. But he wouldn't have cared if anyone ever believed him. What is important is, do you believe Wow, 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 wow. Suddenly another one. Wow. Has to be one of my top three of David Holly's incredible stories. And what a collection this is. What a fantastic reminder of the skill and intricate nature of his stories. Of course, as ever though, I hope you guys enjoyed this one as much as I. But please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag... Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you can pen something packing this much punch, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you all had a fantastic start to the brand new year, getting fully stuck in with life and all the twists and turns that it entails. But above all, guys, Remember, be safe, not sorry.